Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, we're going to first off take a roll call of the present executives. Um, Doug Clemens, Chairman. Rhonda Steelman, Director. Brendan Wilson, Secretary. Bob Allen, Dodge Chairman. Thank you. Um, we are uh, quickly going to go through uh, the minutes which have been submitted via email to our membership um, to take as approved unless there are notations to be made to those minutes. I'm going to make a call now for any notations of the minutes um, or changes. Seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion for approval of last meeting's minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, the motion has been seconded. Can I have a general show of hands for approval of last meeting's minutes? We don't have so many numbers tonight. Interesting. We got a lot of new faces. All right, motion of, uh, of approval is passed. Um, all righty, um, tonight we're doing things a little bit differently than we normally do. Um, this organization runs by committee, and we generally handle a lot of some in house business along with uh, presentation and QA from authorities in our area. Um, we generally have a treasurer report, executive committee report, etc. We are tabling those for tonight's agenda to uh, allow the optimum time for a Q&A period because there are a lot of things going on in our area with uh, BMAC ball field, with construction of an isolation barrier up at, at uh, Westlake Landfill. So we have representatives here from the EPA, the Army Corps, and uh, the Health Department, and basically they're going to do a presentation now, the way we're going to conduct ourselves this evening is simple. We're going to have three presentations. Uh, we are going to reserve Q&A to the end of those presentations. Um, please take notes if necessary. The questions that you should have picked up in the lobby are questions that were submitted during the last meeting by members of the audience, by members of the committee here. The last presentation is going to be um, an answer to those questions. At the end of that, we will have an open Q&A session. That open Q&A session, I will remain chair. If you would like to speak or ask a question, please raise your hand. I will select you. Um, please keep your hand raised until it's selected. And don't speak over anyone. And please limit the time of your questions. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, and would you please state your name for the record um, when you ask a question. Um, basically, I'm ready to turn the meeting over to the EPA and suspend our regular agenda and just uh, go forward with a, an open presentation and then keep the call back to the end. So I ask that uh, introductions be made. There, there's a microphone here. Good evening. My name is Ben Washburn. I work in the Office of Public Affairs at EPA Region 7 in Lenox, Kansas. I'm a community involvement coordinator and the press officer, and in my role I work with the CAG and communities to, to the community to ensure uh, smooth flow of communication, responsiveness, and uh, generally supporting the community as they go through the Superfund process. Um, I have business cards. If you would like my business card, uh, please come up and ask me and feel free to uh, you know, contact me anytime. Last week, we conducted the radiation screening at the British Municipal Athletic Complex. I was there on site, and so I just wanted to give a quick update about that work. The work was completed on May 23rd, and we're still analyzing the gamma screening and the soil samples have been sent off, so we don't have any results yet. Uh, however, after completion of the, the radiation screening, we maintain our position that the ball fields remain suitable for use. Uh, Mary, could you please go to the first slide? gives a, a quick update of how the screening took place. We had three separate teams, a uh, team from EPA Region 7, we also partnered with EPA Region 5. We wanted to get the right experts out there to conduct a screening from where the expertise was and where it was available. So we were able to partner with Region 5 to get that done. The screening was conducted by pushing what's called a field analysis sampling tools buggy and collected over 60,000 data points. Uh, so it was a very thorough screening and I have a map of that that I can show you. They traveled traversed over 45 miles, including the infield, outfield, drainage areas. Very, very thorough. Uh, next slide, please, Mary. 
This gives you an idea of what the, uh, we call them either fast tools or rat tools. This gives you an idea of what they look like. It's, uh, it's a buggy, uh, basically a baby carriage that has been modified. Uh, up top on the right, the attachment is a GPS uh, device to give the precise GPS coordinates of the sampling. And on the bottom, on the back side, what you can see is the sensor, which traveled at the right above the ground level to, to conduct the screening. We, we conducted uh, background surveys at two different areas uh, here locally, and these uh, green dots at the Coke Park survey indicate where we traversed with the, uh, the screening machines. Again, this is the other, other part where we took the background screen. So the background will confirm what is a normal background for the area, and we'll compare that to what is present at BMAC. And this is just uh, one of the workers in action. Inside the Tupperware thing is a computer screen. The Tupperware prevents uh, the sun from getting in there, so it remains useful during bright daylight. This is the meat of the presentation. Uh, this will show. This is the BMAC, and each dot represents a data point which was collected. So you can see from you know all four sides all the way in the middle, uh, pretty much anywhere this, these buggies could traverse, they traversed. 60,000 data points, more than 45 miles. And that shows the BMAC uh, from above with a little bit more information. Uh, these red dot, these excuse me, green dots are discrete samples which were taken. We worked with the community group here to identify where certain, uh, their soil samples were taken. We took soil samples from the same locations. So I'd like to, to thank those that helped us with that. And in addition to those uh, individual samples, more than 100 samples throughout BMAC were collected. So we've got a very thorough, very robust investigation here, which when the results come back in 30 to 45 days, will provide the definitive uh, answers the community is looking for. Again, we'd like to reiterate that after completing this survey, we still maintain that BMAC is suitable for use. Yeah, at this time, I'll turn, hand it over to Denise jordan Izagari from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. She just has a quick update uh, regarding health. ATSDR reviewed the report uh, done by uh, the Just Mothers of St. Louis, I guess. Just Mom of St. Louis, I'm sorry. Um, general comments that uh, we saw a sodium iodide detector which is what was used, is uh, a crystal-based scintillation detector. It's also complicated, but the gamma radiation interacts with that crystal, and that's how you measure uh, the radiation. It undergoes several different kinds of interactions within this, uh, the scintillator, and typically those that we see are from lower level radiation. Um, the ability of the gamma radiation spectrum uh, to uh, can be easily misinterpreted just because of the way it interacts, the way it looks on the scales when it comes out. So sharp peaks have high resolution, whereas wide peaks have low resolution. The peaks are used to identify the radioactive material. If the peaks are too wide, the identification is difficult without specialized software. Which I don't believe we had. We had when that sampling was done. So the sodium iodide detections cannot adequately detect gamma rays energies below 100 kiloelectron volts. Um, then some specific comments about the analysis and, and about how the sample was taken. There's no indication of the equipment used that it had been calibrated. Every time you take an instrument like that and you go to a new site, you have to calibrate it. It's just, that's the only way the system of it can work. Um, there's no reading on a blank. In other words, you would take soil that you know is free of any kind of radiation. So again, you're, you're measuring the dif difference between that and the soil that's found on the site where you were testing. There's no measurement of known concentration, simply because it was difficult to obtain. 
There is no area either in the table or the supply graphic that is a soil background for comparison purposes. In other words, again, there was no soil taken from away from the ball field where you, you believe some of the contamination is. And lastly, the conversion from the CPM per gram to counts per minute gram dry soil to be becquerels. Is that right, Dan? Yeah, Kil uh, per kilogram. It's it. It was incorrect. How it was calculated was incorrect. So it's based on that. What we can say is that there were two samples that appeared to be outside the group average. So if you look at the whole spread of the data that you got, there were two that kind of stand out. And those samples are at field number four and in the drainage area. I know there was a lot of discussion about the drainage area. Um, HS here agrees with the comments of these two sample locations in the report section entitled sample analysis. ATSCR, though, disagrees with the analysis of sample BMA C0010, the one under the bleachers in the field one. The report states there is detectable 46 uh, potassium, I've forgotten now what V is. What's V? Lead? V, the lead, the capital lead V. I'm sorry, I'm not a no-go no, physicist. 46 kilo electron volts. Okay. Do you hear Dan? Um, so, the supposed peak is not meaningful with this uh, type of equipment. So, we can't say yes or no whether there's contamination of field based on this data because of the limitations of the equipment. So, it's really hard other than we haven't seen anything there, so it's safe. And now I think Dan's going to talk. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I can get his logic there. Project documentation 
uh, for the purpose of understanding the overall context of the project and what material may be encountered during the installation and construction of the isolation barrier. Uh, the purpose of this review is not to conduct an investigation of past operations. It is to provide the technical team with an understanding of the site conditions so that the Corps of Engineers team can provide a thorough and effective review and comment on these new isolation barrier documents. Okay, the second question, uh, this is the one where uh, we didn't find a question in there, so hopefully whoever submitted that um, can, uh, can clarify when we get to the end and the Corps of Engineers uh, would be happy to uh, expound on that. Uh, we just didn't understand the question. Uh, number three, uh, Doug Clemens asked, if the Corps of Engineers' opinion is juxtaposed to the EPA, what's the resolution to this process and who specifically will make that decision? Um, and the response here, which is, was provided by the Corps, um, I'll read here. Uh, on a complex site such as Westlake, there are a number of technical disciplines across multiple agencies that form the Corps of Engineers' team that will review the submitted documents. Uh, each disciplinary agency will review the documents and provide comments based on their technical disciplines and experience and perspective. Uh, comments from all the supporting agencies, including the Corps of Engineers, will be provided to EPA. EPA will then consolidate those comments, make sure there are no duplicates of comments, and then make sure that the comments are clearly stated and understandable. Um, if there are any clarifications required, EPA will return the comment to the reviewer and ask that they provide clarification. And once that consolidation is complete, uh, EPA will forward all comments to the responsible party for them to respond to. Um, if required, there will be a design review meeting uh, where all the commenters, the uh, responsible party, their contractors, and the EPA will meet to collectively discuss each comment and response and discuss varying points of view. But we've done these sorts of meetings before. It's primarily if the responsible parties have any questions as to what we're asking them to do. Uh, the result of these meetings may be uh, that all parties come to a consensus on how the comments to be resolved, uh, a requirement by the responsible party and their contractor to perform additional work before a decision is made, or there is no consensus on how the comment is to be resolved, and this really gets to the core of the question, which is what happens if the core and the EPA don't agree. And uh, the response goes on to say, uh, in a case where there is no consensus, additional research, discussions, and consultation with other technical experts may be employed to, employ to obtain the information necessary to resolve comments. In those limited occasions where resolution is not achieved, even after that step, uh, EPA, as the lead agency, has the final decision on how those comments will be resolved. And that decision, to get to uh, question part B, uh, as to who specifically makes that decision, uh, that decision will be made by the Region 7 manager. Okay. Uh, question, the next question, what contingency plan will be for the homeowners and workers when the construction begins opening up the trench? Um, <clears throat> not sure how you define a contingency plan, I mean, obviously, the, uh, you guys have been looking at the, uh, some of you at least, let me know, have been looking at the isolation barrier work plan draft that we placed on our webpage. Uh, it includes an extensive health and safety plan, um, and uh, the future work plans for the actual construction of the trench will include an even more extensive contingency plan. Uh, and, and within the health and safety plan, um, those will include air monitoring and health and safety requirements for the workers and the public, and uh, inherent in those uh, work plans and contingency plans will be uh, a condition to stop work if unsafe conditions are detected by either the air monitoring or any other observations of how the work is proceeding, and the work will be stopped until those conditions can be corrected and it's safe to resume work. Um, those work plans obviously will be part of the future deliverables for the uh, design and construction of the barrier, and we will place those on our website as well for folks to be able to look at. Um, and on top of all of that, uh, we're aware that St. Louis County uh, agencies of various kinds are working together to prepare an emergency operations plan of their own in case of an emergency event at the Westlake landfill because that is their, their prerogative and their purview to work on those sorts of situations. 
Okay, the next question. Uh, in the agreed order, uh, da, 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 da. basically the question is asking for EPA to place uh, draft documents received from the public services on our web page for the public to look at. And uh, EPA has agreed to post those draft work plans on its website, those will be received from the PRPs under the terms of the order. Uh, within a reasonable amount of time, dependent on the technical and administrative requirements for posting the documents, uh, we expect this will take about five business days. And what that means basically is there are laws out there that require that whatever documents we place on our website have to be uh, what's called 508 compliant, which is, uh, I believe, part of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it has to be formatted and accessible so that folks with limited vision or other uh, disabilities are still able to read those documents. So that's why it takes a few days. We can't simply take what the PRPs give us and just upload it. We have to make sure that it's compliant with that. But we are, the answer to that question is yes, we're going to do what you guys asked. And they have already done so. We have already done that with the one document we've received so far under that order, which is the draft of the isolation barrier pre-construction work plan. Okay. Uh, next question on uh, request for 24-7 monitoring. Will EPA provide monitoring in addition to the DNR? The answer to that is yes. Uh, as I think I touched on last time, we are in the process of setting up five off-site air monitoring locations around the site that will run 24-7. Uh, we've talked a little bit about that in some of the recent Westlake update uh, documents that we placed on our web page, and I hope you guys are looking at those because those are we generate one of those every week, and it's kind of a current events description of what's going on and what we expect to be going on. Okay. Uh, next question refers to uh, lab results for the path for the barrier with the core sampling. Um, didn't receive all the results, and if there is a clean line, or excuse me, was a clear path found. Uh, the bottom line with the response to this one is that uh, we've told the responsible parties that there is additional work that they need to do to delineate that uh, uh, barrier alignment. Um, we've got a bunch of data that shows the really radiological material in places we didn't know it was before. Uh, we're not sure that the data that they have provided so far fully delineates and finds that clean edge. So there is going to be a phase two of that work, the GCPT and coring work, that will be done. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly on the schedule because we're still trying to get the PRPs to give us that work plan. Uh, but that data will be necessary before we can say to you all that uh, we have that clear path found. Um, the reason we have not uh, given you the data yet is because it's not been formatted yet. Um, it's all in, in hundreds and hundreds of pages of raw laboratory data that it's difficult for even me to find a, a data point or two. Um, we have uh, informed the PRPs that we do need a summary document from them that summarizes all the data, including the phase two data that's still to be collected, so that we can make our lives easier in making that decision of where this should be, and it will obviously make your guys' life easier to understand the data that making that decision based on. And that data report, once it's you know completed and, and looked at by us, will be put on the web page for you all to look at as well. Okay, next question. We would like to see written information from STL Corp Radio 226 or 230. Uh, this was another one that we didn't quite understand. Uh, the part that I think was being asked about is talking about you know, basically what instruments we're going to use and how we're going to use them for our air sampling stations. Um, each of those stations, as I touched on uh, last month's CAG, is going to have a variety of different instruments to detect radiation, um, alpha, beta, and gamma, in both real time and with delayed measurements that will have a much greater sensitivity that we can then report uh, to much lower detection levels, and that will involve laboratory analyses that will be more of that confirmation sample type data that we need. Um, the quality assurance plan that EPA is developing that will fully describe the instruments and how they're going to be used excuse me, um, is still being developed and that will obviously be finalized before we start collecting the actual data and reporting it to you. Um, and again, if, there, if we miss the point of that question, when we get to the end, somebody can clarify it. I'd be happy to uh, expound on that as best as I can. Okay, the next question was a real open-ended one. What happened at the Remedy Review Board? Well, um, what happened was uh, they got involved because the remedies that were evaluated in the supplemental feasibility study, which was finalized in December 2011, 
uh, the cost of those remedies all exceeded $25 million. And that's a threshold that uh, our EPA headquarters has decided is a number over which we need to get the Remedy Review Board involved because their function is to evaluate those remedies to make sure that they are consistent with remedies that have been selected at other similar sites, if any, and that those remedies are cost effective, that they're using uh, taxpayer dollars, or in this case, uh, the responsible parties' dollars uh, in an in effective, cost effective manner. Um, so we made that presentation uh, in early 2012 uh, based on the results of the Supplemental Feasibility Study. Um, and the Remedy Review Board uh, provided a number of comments to Region 7 asking for additional studies and analyses to kind of bulk up uh, some of the discussions of aspects of those remedies that, was, that were incorporated in the Supplemental Feasibility Study, uh, including additional groundwater monitoring, which uh, you know, I've talked to you guys a number of times about over the past uh, year or so, uh, those quarterly sampling and results, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the results of those quarterly sampling events are up on our webpage, and uh, we have uh, the United States Geological Survey helping us to understand those and evaluate those. Um, so at this point, uh, having those National Remedy Review Board uh, comments and questions on the Supplemental Feasibility Study in hand, uh, we went to the responsible parties and said, hey, we need you to do these additional analyses. Uh, to clear up these questions that the board raised, and they agreed to do that. So uh, they've submitted work plans to us for most of that work as to how they propose to do it. And uh, our headquarters team, who assisted the board, um, is reviewing those work plans to make sure that they adequately meet the needs of what the Remedy Review Board wanted to see done. Uh, once those approvals are uh, received from headquarters, uh, we'll direct the PRPs to begin that work. And uh, the results of those additional studies will be uh, incorporated into what we're, call we're calling a supplemental supplemental feasibility study, uh, which will, of course, be released to you guys for your review. <coughs> okay. Contingency plans for controlling and putting out any surface fires. 
uh, mineral risk of firefighters and so on and so forth. Uh, EPA is, is not a firefighting agency. Um, so at this point, as I said earlier, we know that a variety of emergency response uh, entities within St. Louis County are working together to uh, prepare an emergency response plan in case things such as this do happen so that they will be prepared to respond to them. And I believe that they're getting um, information from the responsible parties, the public and such, as necessary to help them prepare that plan. Um, uh, the local government, I mean, EPA has no authority to uh, to call for an evacuation. That would be a decision that would be uh, the ultimate responsibility of the local governments and the local emergency response agencies. Um, and the second part of the question, will an explanation of the contingency plan be given to the CAG, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that's something that you guys can certainly ask the St. Louis County uh, agencies to provide. Um, and I, I, as I said, I know they've been working on that for a while. It would probably be helpful to the CAG to have those guys come in and, and speak a little bit about what they've come up with, uh, perhaps uh, assuage some of the fears of the community. Uh, what contingency plan will be for the homeowners and workers when construction begins opening up a trench? This is kind of similar to a question that came up earlier in the list. Again, the, the work plans for actually doing the installation of the isolation barrier will include uh, uh, conditions to, to stop the work if unsafe conditions are found. Uh, Mary, hmm? could you turn off the projector? Again, if, if these unsafe conditions are detected, the work can be stopped until those conditions can be corrected. Um, and uh, again, those work plans will be uh, shared with you all through our website once they are available. Um, I can't get into more detail than that at this point because uh, we'll need to work with uh, uh, the responsible parties once they provide a draft uh, to work with our, all of our uh, cooperating agencies, including the, the Army Corps of Engineers, to evaluate whether the uh, the measures that they propose were adequate. Um, part of that uh, will be an extensive on-site air monitoring network that the responsible parties will operate that will complement the five off-site locations that EPA will be operating. And we can revisit that question in the future as uh, more of those uh, uh, work plans and such become available. So obviously, if you know, this doesn't have to be the only time we talk about these issues, any of these questions for that matter, because more information will be coming in the future that we can used to refine the discussions that we have here. Okay, next question. What is the minimal detectable activity of the instrumentation used by EPA to survey the BMAC? Uh, well, Ben went into that some. Uh, it was a combination of the, uh, the rapid assessment tool, which was in a baby carriage, uh, and that is as purely a gamma scanning device. Um, and then, as Ben said, there were more than 100 more than 100 uh, soil samples were dug out of the ground and sent to an off-site analytical laboratory, which will be able to uh, detect well below six, six picocuries per gram. And not only that, but it will be able to tell us by isotope what uh, species, what radionuclides in the soil are emitting those alphas, betas, and gammas. So we will have some very picture of blooming thorium-230, if any. Uh, were found in any of these soil samples, and that will complement nicely the 60,000 plus uh, data points that we've gotten for gammas uh, from the, the rapid assessment tool. <laughs> so we will be able to uh, give you a very detailed answer to that question once we have the laboratory analytical results from those soil samples. Okay, I guess that's the last question. So I'm scrolling. Uh, there, there was one. There is. Oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. Okay. Uh, the proper response to elevated transuranic levels in the soil is to perform dis detailed and systematic soil sampling. Why is a different method being used in BMAC? Well, for starters, um, there were no transuranic elements out there. Transuranic means uh, uh, mass numbers or uh, atomic numbers higher than uranium. Um, and since these were natural uranium ores, there's nothing above uranium out there. Uranium, thorium, and radium are, are not transuranic. They're naturally occurring. Um, as far as uh, elevated levels in general of radionuclides, uh, we weren't sure exactly what the, uh, the information that was provided to us from the public sampling uh, represented in terms of actual concentrations in the soil. 
Um, but uh, having said that, since we've already gone out there and done the detailed and systematic soil sampling, uh, you know, we're, we're responding to this comment basically by doing exactly what the comment suggested. So um, I think at the time this comment was submitted, perhaps it was before we had gone public with exactly the scope of what we were going to do at BMAX. So, uh, I believe what we have done and what Ben talked about earlier has, has exactly addressed this question. Um, there is a question number two that I don't get. There, there's a question number two that I think we missed going through the uh, page, at least on my sheet. Well, there was one that I said that we didn't know it was a question at all. Number two. Oh, I see. That was one that we couldn't figure out well, what they were Actually, at the, at the uh, top it's asking me who within the Army Corps is specifically responsible for, for each of the things listed below. Okay, um, if, if that's the, the, the gist of the question, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Robin to come up, uh, Robin Kiefer from the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and the City Office, who's technical lead for the interagency agreement with EPA to provide the technical assistance for evaluating these isolation barrier documents, and uh, she will be able to answer that question. Good evening, I'm Robin Keever. I'm with the Corps of Engineers, as Dan had indicated. Uh, the question was, who specifically? At this time, I'm not going to give names because before I could give specific names of personnel, um, I would need to let them know that we're going to be releasing their names publicly. I didn't realize that's what the question was for. Um, but what I can tell you is that uh, what disciplines that we're using for the reviews. Um, are you wanting to know specifically for each of these activities? Answer, answer the question as best you can. I, I okay. can ask the question so the audience most likely didn't know to clarify. Okay. Okay. Uh, on the review team, uh, for the isolation barrier um, work plans and design reviews, we have two civil engineers with geotechnical uh, uh, emphasis who will be reviewing the majority of the documents. And um, they are uh, the geotechnical engineers, one of them has specific experience with structural, um, structural calculations of subsurface barriers. The other has experience with landfills and with uh, radiologically impacted materials. So both of them will be reviewing the majority of the designs and the work plans. We also have a biologist who will be reviewing the bird hazard mitigation plan. Um, we have a health physicist who will be reviewing uh, pretty much all the documents as well. Health physicists, um, as you may or may not know, their job is specifically to deal with the health and safety of uh, radiologically impacted sites. Um, they look at the data, they make sure that you're looking at the right uh, contaminant concentrations, daughter products, etc. And then they, look, they, they understand the health impacts to the public and uh, what they do is they review based on uh, that information and, and give their comments on that. So um, those are the primary people who are going to be reviewing this, uh, the work plans. Um, you've got to also remember that the Corps of Engineers and our technical expertise that we're bringing is specifically for this isolation barrier and those health impacts. There are other team members that uh, EPA is also using uh, who will be reviewing this work plan. Uh, people like the, uh, I guess, USGS, if there's any kind of chemical data that's involved, um, and, and then other experts in the EPA. So from the core standpoint, uh, those are the people that we will be using. Are there, did I answer the question? Are there any follow-ups? I think follow that's an adequate answer. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask, you might as well stay on stage because I have a funny feeling you're going to be asking the right question. Okay. Um, no, I know you've all been sitting patiently through the, this, and um, I would like to, to open this up for open question and answer time. So please, if I show of hand, um, I'll recognize you, and you may. Yes, sir. And please state your name. Okay. My, my name is Jerry Grimmer. I'm a councilman ward to the city of Bridgeton. Let's, let's start back with question two. I think it's very clear what the question is. Do you have a plan? And when can you tell us about the plan? That's basically, I think, what, what, what was being asked here. And you've given us a lot of, a little bit of a technical background. You're reading some reports and everything, but do you have a plan that's going to protect the citizens? There's quite a bit of concern when you go in there and open up that, that landfill and start digging in there. Do you have a plan that's going to be protective of the citizens? And this is what I think the core of that, of, of that question. That's a very easy question, and why you guys had so much difficulty 
understanding that is beyond me. Are you talking about question two? Question number two. Which I have to is, it is. Okay. So, um, let's go with work plan on that. Yeah, the work plan. Uh, do we have a work plan? The Corps of Engineers is not preparing a work plan. The responsible parties are preparing the work plan for the work that's going to be done. And this is for the pre-construction activities. A, uh, in accordance with the administrative order on consent for pre-construction work, the, work, the RPs were responsible for providing a work plan for the pre-construction work. They have provided that, and the Corps is in the process of reviewing it. Our technical folks are reviewing that document. Uh, comments, we will provide comments to EPA next week. Okay. When will we, we as citizens have a chance to maybe look at that plan to reassure ourselves what measures you, you are going to put in place so that we have some assurances how this process is going to unfold? Well, the, the pre-construction work plan that the responsible parties uh, provided pursuant to that order is on our web page now for anybody who wants to take a look at. It's still just a draft. Uh, you know, obviously, we'll all come on a, comment on an EPA and Corps of Engineers and our ORD folks. And uh, once we've provided those comments back to responsible parties and told them what changes need to be made, they'll make those and provide a final document. And if they've made their changes properly, we'll approve it and then they'll go forth and do the work. Again, as Robin mentioned, that's just for the pre construction activities, which are preparing the site and the area for the actual construction of the barrier, there will be a completely different set of documents that have yet to be submitted because they'll be submitted pursuant to a second legal order with the responsible parties that EPA is working on but has not yet finalized. Uh, those documents will describe in great detail exactly how such a barrier would be constructed, where it will be constructed, uh, very detailed descriptions of health and safety issues, of contingency plans in case certain things happen during the construction of that barrier to ensure that both the workers and the public remain safe during that construction. So what you're asking for is a document that we don't yet have, but we will have and we will share it with you when it's available. And do you have any idea when that's going to be, a couple of weeks? I try not to speculate on schedules like that again because I said that the legal order that will compel the responsible parties to provide that work plan and then do the work has not yet been signed. So I really can't speculate on that at this time. I have another, if I can, please. On One more here. I'm, I'm going to try and get around. I'll come back to you if necessary. All right, very well. Um, next question, please. Yes. I was just going to, my name is Don Chapman. I was going to piggyback off of what he just said, piggyback. Um, the, when we read the draft work plan and the air monitors that you were talking about that are going to run 24 hours a day, the protocol for like what happens when you get a sample and stuff was listed in there, it doesn't sound as though those are going to be real time. And we kind of talked about that the last CAG meeting as far as air monitors for any work being done up there, because I know you guys talk about dust control and dust mitigation and stuff like that. Is there such thing as real-time air monitoring that will tell the moment there's an issue for the people that live in the, and work in the surrounding area? Did everyone hear the question? Um, Don Chapman asked if there is a possibility to real-time survey of air monitoring so that people that live and work in the area would be notified immediately if there are radionucleotides detected in the air. And I don't know if I can handle that line. Uh, Don, the, the isolation barrier pre-construction work plan that we put on the webpage that, uh, that you have looked at, and you know, we've seen some of your comments already that you submitted to them, um, that's describing the PRP's on-site air monitoring system. They're not talking about EPA's off-site air monitoring system. Um, they will be trying to do similar things, but they will not be using exactly the same instruments. They will not be under the same work plan. As I mentioned earlier, um, we're finalizing our own EPA clock that will govern exactly how we run those instruments in our off-site EPA air monitoring stations on how we will share, well, how we will report that data to ourselves. Um, I'm not sure the co-op itself will describe how we're going to convey that information then to the public, but we know that it's something that you guys are very keenly interested in, and it's something that we have to figure out based on the, the capabilities of the system, how, you know, what our options are even for 
conveying that data to the public, especially in an emergency situation. Um, we will you know, we'll work very hard to make sure that that is as rapid as possible. I don't know of specific plans yet. Um, I expect that we might need to, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's something that a bunch of us are thinking about already, and we have to have that clock finalized and know the instrument capabilities before we can make a, a full plan on exactly how to communicate that to you folks. But of course, the whole point of doing this air sampling is to protect the public, so we're very aware that you folks need to know if something's going on that's bad as soon as possible. Will that, will that be up before the trench work is allowed to start? Oh, you know, absolutely. Oh, know. absolutely, yes. Uh, both the on-site air stations that the PRPs are getting ready to install and the off-site air monitoring stations that EPA has already installed and is bringing up on speed uh, will be running long before the, the trench construction begins for several reasons. One, we want to make sure it's working reliably. And two, we want to get a very good idea of what the naturally occurring or normal background conditions of all these contaminants are so that we can compare them to the results we get once that construction starts, see if there are changes, what sorts of changes, um, trying to understand exactly what effects that construction might be having on the air quality. Yes, there are, and in fact, uh, some of the instruments that we're uh, uh, adding to the air stations, each station will have more than one instrument. And each station will have the same set of instruments. There'll be five sets of the same instruments uh, working together to do a variety of types of analyses. Some will be real-time measurement ones that will be recording you know, data continuously, and we have uh, radio links from those air stations back to a central load monitoring location where that data can be loaded onto uh, the internet and communicated back to us in Kansas City in, in real time. Uh, other types of instruments that perhaps have lower detection limits for some of those same alpha, beta, gamma, um, and radionuclides and such uh, will be, uh, you know, the, there'll be things that collect dust on filters and such that will have to be changed out every week and sent to a lab. Those won't be useful for the real-time emergency type monitoring uh, and notification that you folks are concerned about, but they will have the much lower detection limits that will be able to confirm that those real-time measurements are in fact representative of what's really going on. That makes sense, thank you. Um, please state your name. Uh, Harvey Bergman with Representative Oswald. Uh, are there established uh, guidelines for radionuclides in the air, and if there are, uh, can you please point us to you know, provide a reference to those uh, documents to establish those thresholds? Uh, the question was, are there established levels for radionuclides in the air? Yes, and safety levels. Yeah. At safety levels, and, and if so, can we be directed towards the documents that contain those levels? I'm used to that, Doug. You should know that. <laughs> Um, Harvey, the answer to your question is yes. However, I'm not a health physicist or an, an air person, so I do not have those off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure that they will be mentioned in our clock, but I will have Ben, since he has a pen, write down that we need to get back to you on that, and we will get, get that reference for you, references for you. I, will, I believe ATSCR has them in the back of the tox profiles for uranium, radium, and thorium. So you can just go to the back and list the numbers. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ed Smith of the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. Um, are there going to be any more actual studies or reports of what happens when a smoldering fire impacts the rim at the Westlake landfill other than reviews of the report submitted by EMSI to EPA? Uh, again, did everyone hear that question? Very good. Uh, okay, Ed, uh, that's pretty similar to one of the questions that was in the list, but I want to go back to the, uh, what we said specifically and see, uh, make sure that uh, I'm consistent with what you want to know and see, where is that? 
Well, I mean, I wrote, I wrote down what you said. Okay. I mean, that's why I asked the question, because I'm looking for more clarity. Okay. I mean, is it in, there, there must be a work plan or a scope of work for the supplemental supplemental. Does the supplemental supplemental consider a smoldering fire an impact on, say, the risk assessment if it's left there or anything like that? Well, I, I have to, I know what you're asking now, Ed, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, as I said earlier, there isn't really a way to, to quantify how such an SSE would occur or move around in one of the OU cells. Um, there's just too many variables and uncertainties, so we, we can't run some sort of a numeric model to say, oh, it would move this far in this many days, or it would go this deep, or it would last this long, or it would release this, that, or the other thing. Um, without having those kind of numbers, um, not only can we not do the kind of more detailed analysis that I think you're asking for uh, with any sort of certainty whatsoever, but we also really can't calculate human health risks, which I think is what you're asking about as well. Uh, because when you do a risk assessment, you have to be able to quantify the exposure of a person or a receptor to a particular contaminant. You have to know how much they're going to get exposed to and for how long or for how often. And without having any sort of an idea of what some one of these reactions would do, there's just no way to come up with a, a believable set of numbers that we could then say, this is the risk. There's, there's just no way to get a number on that. Right. But I mean, if memory serves me correct, the, the baseline health risk assessment that informed the 2008 record of decision uh, pretty much ruled out groundwater transport as a way for the radioactive wastes to move off site. Well, you've got the Office of Research and Development at EPA and the USGS, uh, maybe not USGS, but, well, the USGS certainly talked about the, the possibility for, for uh, leachate to move the radioactive materials offsite due to groundwater. Um, there are risks there. So, you know, how is EPA going to evaluate the, the real risks that we know will happen with the leachate and the mobilization of the radioactive waste in the groundwater? Because it's real, we know that that can happen. You can't just simply put that as a zero because you don't know the exposure rate to people. That, that, that just seems like a very difficult thing to, to, to weigh there. I think you're talking about two related things there. Um, definitely the more recent groundwater data that we have shows that radium in particular and other contaminants are in more places around the site than we knew about before. Um, but that, having a concentration at a place does not necessarily equate to a certain risk. When you do a risk assessment, you have to figure out what the exposure is. Uh, is somebody drinking this water? If they are, how often? Is somebody's child playing in contaminated dirt? If so, what's the concentration in that dirt? How many hours do they play per day? If there's contamination in the groundwater, but nobody's drinking it, and we can ensure through various institutional controls and controls on where wells are drilled and things like that to make sure that in the future people aren't drinking it. Then even though there's contamination there, that EPA would require the PRPs to do something about. It doesn't necessarily represent a human health risk. And Denise, did you want to weigh in on that at all? Because she is the health expert and I'm not. answered it perfectly well. There has to be, to be actual exposure to one of the mediums, whether it's air, soil, or, or water. And without that, it doesn't matter what's in the so, so even though the ORD said that there's a possibility for airborne exposure and groundwater, or airborne releases, yeah, I'm, cut you off, I'm just sorry, but th this is a frustrating topic for me. Uh, so even though the Office of Research and Development says there's a possibility for it to move offsite via groundwater in the leachate or, or become airborne, the EPA, I guess the answer to that is no. You guys are not going to consider that in the risk assessment to inform the record of decision amendment. Is that and correct? Before you answer, let me, let me tail in on that and just say, is it a potential pathway, a potential pathway? Uh, I, if there's a potential for it to be airborne, whether we have exposure or not, then we have potential exposure, and isn't that a risk factor that the EPA would consider? 
we can consider it in a qualitative manner. We can acknowledge, we're not going to ignore in the risk assessment the possibility of an SSC, but we can calculate a risk. We can acknowledge that there's a possibility that something like this could happen, and if it does, as ORD mentioned it, as you correctly mentioned, that they mentioned, um, that there are possibilities that this material could be spread around in leachate, could be spread around in some sort of a vapor or dust. We will not be able to put a number to that. Yes, ma'am. This is the first time here, and I'm trying to get some information. Very good. I'm stupid, okay, but I've got a question. When the wind blows the right way, we get the dirt. Our car is covered with it. Our windows are covered with it. Our faces are covered with it. And it's from the top. Now, when you start digging that trench, and you're so close to that radioactivity, is that going to guarantee me that that stuff is not going to be radioactive coming on my face, and on my car, and on my windows? And in your name, ma'am? Ann Holtz. And thank you. And did everyone hear that question? Yeah. All right. Um, please. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I know a lot of people are going to have you know similar concerns about that. Both you know now, as you say, dust is blowing around, and in the future when the construction goes on, uh, the main reason that uh, we and the responsible parties are going to be installing and operating so many of these air monitoring stations is to quantify what's in the air and to determine whether it is in fact you know contaminated with radiation or some other contaminants. Um, if it's dust that uh, you know we analyze and it does not have radionuclides in it or other contaminants that are related to that excavation, obviously it's still a nuisance to you. You're still breathing it and coughing, but it would not represent uh, a radiological risk. Now, if for whatever reason during that excavation or any future work at the site, uh, if these air monitors or other uh, health and safety measures at the site detect some sort of an unsafe condition for the workers or for the off-site folks uh, through these air monitors and, and uh, other measurement devices, then the work would be temporarily stopped until uh, the responsible parties under the observation of either EPA or the Army Corps or both would be able to determine what went wrong and fix it so that uh, the public and the workers are protected. And that goes back a little bit to what Don Chapman asked earlier about how would the public be notified. Uh, we need to work out exactly how those sorts of situations would be quickly communicated to the local uh, emergency uh, officials so that they could make whatever determinations they needed to make for public safety. Bring me an air monitor, put it in my front yard, so I know what it's saying. Whereabouts do you live, if I may ask? I live in the middle of the home park. OK, there's going to be one right next door to the mobile home a little That's bit <laughs> the air moves around a lot we, we have five of them in a circle around the site to be able to measure air concentrations no matter which direction the wind is blowing and that will be in addition to the 11 or 12 that the PRPs are proposing to put on site so uh, you know the, the air air folks air sampling folks and emergency response folks that we have within EPA have come up with these locations to be a good coverage area of the site including Spanish Village, the mobile home park, the local businesses, etc. Before you give the microphone back to me, I have a follow-up question. There, All right. there are other things in the landfill aside from radiologically impacted materials. Um, will there be monitoring for other carcinogens, other toxins coming out of the landfill on an on emergency notice? There will be me measurements for other types of contaminants, uh, particularly volatile organic compounds, including benzene, which I know that the MDNR sampling has found a number of times, and some other uh, landfill gases, for lack of a better term, the things that stink, uh, for, you know, hydrogen sulfide and things like that, that also can potentially have uh, health risks associated with them. So it's not purely for radionuclides. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that the uh, the Citizens Advisory Group passed a resolution at the latter part of last year that actually requested any work to be done on, on this trench to be covered work, the, the temporary structure to be built above it to minimize and, and completely contain any risk. And you had a question, Sarah. Um, I would say you're looking at a report of the last uh, DNR report. 
be in our report. And your name would be? John Foggy. On the uh, water, on the effluent violations, they're in violation of the Clean Water Act. They have had exceedances all four quarters of last year at two outfalls. All they're required to test is once a quarter after the first heavy rainfall, and nothing is being tested for raving new pipes. So we're going to be washing off a bunch of stuff that's dug up. It's going to go out those same places all the runoff. Are they going to be required to test that more frequently, those water grabs? And are they going to, and I know the lab they use in Florida has rated pipes listed. They just don't check for them. They check the area that says, believe not there. Oh, okay. Did everyone hear that question? No. I didn't think so. It's kind of a complex question, too. So apparently, um, the landfill has been in violation of the Clean Water Act for the last four quarters straight. Um, they're required to perform one test um, per quarter. Um, that test does not require radionuclide. No. It does not require the test for radionuclides in the water. Um, we are introducing water into the landfill during this process, apparently, and we want to know what will be done about the water that's currently not passing muster and is continuing to uh, not meet the Clean Water Act. And will extra testing be required in order to make sure that the water being introduced to clean machinery, that sort of thing, is up to spec? Uh, let's check this one. All right. <laughs> uh, Actually, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. As you mentioned, uh, it, it's a state uh, sampling program. The NPDES permit that's given to the Republic folks is given by MDNR, the state of Missouri. Uh, the ability to write those permits and the oversight of those permits was delegated to the state. So they have the authority to write those permits and to determine what the facility is required to sample for and how often they're required to sample. Um, so I would suggest uh, communicating that question and that concern through the CAG, because I imagine that you know, you've know you raised it and I expect other people are worried about it as well. That would be something that I recommend uh, Doug and CAG communicate to uh, the state, uh, probably to Chris Noble, because he's a solid waste guy, um, and ask him about that. Um, and if they have any uh, uh, ideas or plans to modify what's required during this construction. And would the EPA address, um, and you might work on this question too, would the EPA address water used to clean equipment, that sort of thing, um, if, because we're talking about water that is going to contact with the Anything like that that's directly related to the performance of the work of that construction would be something that EPA would regulate and specify how they would need to do it. Uh, basically, uh, water such as that used to clean equipment or, or people or what have you would be what's considered to be an investigation-derived waste or a, a waste stream generated from the work. And that's something that would be separate from the NPDES permit that you're talking about. And that would be something where we would specify at great length in the work plans for that construction how it would need to be washed, where it would need to be washed, how it would be, the water would be tested, and what would be done with it. Okay. Actually, Ms. Frigg. My name is Tanya Mason, and this is a reference to question four and 11. On there, it was asked a contingency plan or like an evacuation for residents. I feel like that question keeps getting skirted. Um, is it, do you make that plan, or is it up to our local? Who are we supposed to be looking at? Because I don't um, feel like we've ever got an answer on it. EPA, um, during both questions this evening, suggested that St. Louis County uh, um, emergency authorities are, are who we need to talk to, and that would be also here locally at the um, fire district. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so we're saying that they worry about the workers only, and then they refer whatever they know to our local, and then we have to depend on them to get to, you know? Exactly. Um, so, so um, I. I will be happy to have our local authorities come and speak to us. Uh, they're more than willing to, and they have a lot of questions that they usually ask at these events, so unfortunately they, they don't seem to be here tonight. Okay. Can I ask a second question? Certainly, real quick. The odors. Has anybody talked about the odors and what we, I live in Spanish Village, and I know what we've had to live with so far. When they start dating and all this, what do you guys anticipate for us odor-wise? Uh, it's going to stink. There's, there's no two ways about it. Um, it's going to, you know, we're unearthing a lot of, or 
will be unearthing a lot of fairly recent waste, municipal solid waste. It's going to smell like a landfill. Um, obviously, we'll want the uh, responsible parties to uh, get that work done expeditiously so the amount of time that that waste is exposed and stinking will be minimized. But during that work, there's going to be a definite increase in the odor. There's, there's no two ways about it. I guess I'm confused. It's not okay, though. I mean, we live there. I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I live there 24-7. That's not okay. What do you want us to do? What am I supposed to do? Just say it's okay because you guys said? Well, it's not okay, but it's an unfortunate side effect of needing to do the work that the community has requested and that the responsible party has okay. agreed to do to prevent any potential you know, future impact of the existing subsurface oxidation event in the South Quarry landfill from ever migrating anywhere near the radiologically impacted material. There's simply no way to install a barrier that will prevent that without disturbing the waste and therefore generating these odors. I, I, I just want to tap onto your question and say, you know, early on in elementary school, we learned that smells are particles in the air that, that we're sensing in our nervous system. So there, there's stuff in the air. Um, isn't there a mitigation system that, that would contain gases during this process? Uh, I'm not aware of one. I know that the responsible parties have experimented with the spraying odor neutralization compounds into the air uh, while some of the odor events going on with the, uh, the subsurface oxidation event uh, was happening. I, I spent a fair amount of time on the landfill at the height of some of those odors, and I can tell you it didn't work. Um, but that's not very much comfort to you folks who will be living here, not just uh, working there uh, for a week. Um, I simply don't know of a way that that can be prevented. There, there is a, there is, I, I need to say this also, there, there is a request currently being submitted to our Attorney General for um, the PRPs to, to take care of relocation during this process. Um, we'll, we'll, of course, have to see where that goes. Um, next question. Well, I was just going to ask about what you just said, because previously when they dug up the pipes, the Attorney General had to issue an order to Republic to relocate the people. And it, if it had not been for the Attorney General's lawsuit against them, it would not be done, it would not have been done previously. And so I was just wondering, is that going to have to be able to say there could be a relocation offer to the people who live in the area? Because I live in Spanish Village too. And I think that's really the core of these questions about that is, is there going to be an offer for the people in the area, which basically would be the trailer park, Spanish Village, and other areas, will there be an offer for relocation during the time of that digging as the Attorney General's offer or the lawsuit required before? Is that going to be a part of your requirements as you all, as you investigate and form that uh, plan? Can that be a part of your plan so that we don't have to go through the Attorney General and sue them? And, and let me let me tack on to, to Bob's question and say that, that we have been given a, a line in the sand about responsibility with, within the Richmond landfill and Westlake landfill and the idea that EPA has control over part of it and the state has control over part of it. The EPA won't touch this part. Well, we're in a gray area all of a sudden where I, I'm told that EPA has ultimate authority about the construction of the trench. So my my gut reaction is that. It's EPA's role, the federal government's role in this particular case to tell the PRPs this has got to be part of the plan. Um, again, we also have the Attorney General's not out, but. Um, it's a good question. I know that that's, there's a precedent that that was done before during the height of the odor issue going on in the South Quarry landfill. Um, I have never pretended to be a lawyer. I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer now. Um, I do not know if EPA can legally compel. PRPs to relocate. I will ask Ben to write that down on our list of things to check out and I will get back to you on that. Thank you. Honest enough. Oh. I actually, um, in the back, real quick, and then you. Just a quick correction or point of information the barrier construction is not at the request of the community, it's at the request of. 
the lawsuit from the Attorney General. I'm sure the community wants to be kept safe, but the community did not engineer or request that. That was something that was uh, both by us. Duly noted, thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Dan. Your response to number three uh, was a rather uh, extensive process of reviewing uh, documents and comments from different agencies regarding work plans and then eventually uh, having maybe question and answer sessions with the PRPs and going over it and figuring all this out. Uh, in, and, and this was in response to, uh, uh, you know, the core stands and judge the position of the APA, how, how set this up. Um, will those intermediate comments and documents be made available to the public? Is there any, any public access to that process, not necessarily input, Nice. But how do we know what's going on? How do we know what agencies have made what comments? And just as a, another little sidebar, um, you said that one of the processes you go through is removing duplicates. Uh, I sure hope when you remove the duplicates that somewhere in there you're noting which agencies said the same thing over and over again because that kind of would stress that it's an important issue that needs to be addressed. And, and I hope that doesn't get lost in the consolidation process, but uh, will the, the public have any access during this, this, this long process to see what the comments are and the concerns are that are coming back from the experts that you and the car are here? And did everyone hear that question? Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm sure that eventually the final comment letters that we send to the responsible parties will be FOIA or will be released and you guys will see what the comments are, and in some cases you'll see who they came from. Um, we will definitely keep track of who said what, and if two or three agencies said the same thing, we, we track that because that's important um, for any of the eventual decision-making processes. Um, but as far as I know at this point, we're not planning on releasing the draft, messy, uh, repetitive interactions that the various commenters will have with each other before we finalize that combined set of comments and give it to the PRPs uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it'd be very difficult to keep up with the back and forth between the various commenters in any sort of real time. And two, just from a workload perspective, uh, it's, you know, it would be a tremendous slowdown on us to try to do that and, and uh, get every intermediate draft uh, posted for people. It's just, it's just not something that's going to add anything to your understanding of how we comment on these four plans. So we're not planning on doing that now. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm Linda Eaker from the Bridgeton City Council. I haven't been to one of these CAG meetings before because I had a conflicting event on Monday nights. And I, it's probably just as well I didn't come because I'm, I get angry sitting here listening. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of, wh when were you first, when was it the first mention of the trench and the order made to have it done? How long ago was that? Bob, do you recall when the AG did that order? I believe it was early last year or late 2012. I know the trench was relocated before. It was May. the summer last year. May. July, somewhere around in there. I honestly don't remember off the top of my head. Well, uh, you don't need to because really it's been a long, it's been quite a while, and I and I see the process as it's going on. It's going to take a long time because I heard what you were saying. The EPA is going to talk to, to the core, which is I'm glad you're talking, but then we're going to talk back to the EPA and back to the core and back here and this and that, you know. And I I'm sitting here thinking, here's a lot of people here sitting here thinking. When is anything really going to get done? You know, I can see, sense and see their anger. I have anger. I have frustration. You know, it, it, it's almost like it's a bother that maybe there's stuff in the air and, you know, and I, I hope you don't mean to imply that, but, you know, I, I feel very, very incensed that, you know, oh, maybe there's stuff blowing here and stuff blowing there. Do you want to come live here while they're opening it up? Do you want to come live here all the time? Would you live here? This close to what's going on? I, I and you know, and can you make maybe a Cliff Notes version of you know what you're doing? You know, like 
let's say we're doing this, we're doing that, this, that. I hear a lot of if, if, well, maybe if, if, if. Okay, and I understand because of science there's a lot of unknowns. But, but I, I'm frustrated. That's all I have. Well, as far as giving you the, the, the so-called Cliff Notes version that you're asking about, um, on our webpage, we're putting up these weekly Westlake update documents, and I suggest you go through those uh, as they come out because we try to keep those uh, simple and topical and timely so that they're matching with what's really going on that week or the, the week before. And they go back to February. We started doing that in February. Uh, other than just weekly, you know, what's this is this is almost June. What is, what is going to be done in June? What's going to be done in July? What's the plan? Do you not know? We have a uh, poster board here that uh, we can help folks walk through a little bit afterwards, um, maybe as a group or something, to try to speculate, or not speculate, but give you some preview of what's coming. Uh, unfortunately, as far as a schedule, we don't have hard dates. And one of the main reasons for that is a lot of what you've been hearing tonight from some other folks, concerns about what's going to happen when we have the PRPs build that trench. You know, what's it going to uncover? What about, uh, you know, surface water runoff and NPDES permits and things like that? Um, you know, the stakes are fairly high and we cannot afford to rush the planning and the implementation of that work. So uh, we're trying to walk a fine line between being prompt and responsive and getting this problem resolved and not doing it in a quick and dirty method, so to speak, that causes more problems than it solves. So it's it's a tough balance. And have you done this other places? We, there are no other landfills that I'm aware of that have radiological waste in one cell and a subsurface reaction in another. Um, as, as I said earlier, we have the experts from ORD who have worked on landfills with these subsurface oxidation reactions going on, so they know how to deal with that. That part of the technology is known. But just you know, some of the questions that Ed and others have raised about, well, what would happen if there's really no precedent for that? So there's nothing we can point to. And that's why we feel urgency as a community. Uh, actually, um, can you explain the relationship of the EPA to the PRPs, what the PRPs are, um, how Superfund works? I can certainly do that. Um, the PRPs are for well, there are four entities, three companies and the Department of Energy of the federal government um, who are responsible for the contamination. That's a legal determination, meaning that they were involved with creating this waste, having it come to be placed where it is. Um, so they are legally responsible for addressing, uh, cleaning up, responding to the problems caused by that waste under the Superfund statute. Uh, that also means that they pay for the work that needs to be done to accomplish all of those goals. They reimburse EPA for money that we spend out of our own pocket to observe what they do, to review their work plans and approve them, and to make sure that they follow those work plans so that taxpayer dollars are not spent to fix this problem that was created by these other private parties. Now, I know Ed has mentioned in previous meetings that the Department of Energy is an agency of the federal government, so in some ways, yes, a few taxpayer dollars are being spent because, in part, this problem was caused by the Department of Energy and their uh, previous agency, which was the Atomic Energy Commission, which was in charge of, uh, you know, preparing the, uh, the uranium for the World War II uh, Manhattan Project. Is that what you needed? Uh, that, that's what I was looking for. I, I, I also want to add that, that the PRPs are the first responsible part, party for doing the testing. They subcontract out to their own company to do the testing and produce the reports. Now, I know I've got hands here. There have been hands in the back for a long time. So, so. Did you want to let oh, I'm sorry, Mary. I didn't. One moment. No problem. Thank you. Uh, hi folks, I'm Mary Peterson, I'm with EPA, and I just wanted to speak for a moment. Was it Linda um, had mentioned something that really grabbed my attention? Um, and this is new, uh, this is a new product, it just showed up on our uh, webpage today, okay? Um, and what this is intended to do is show some of the milestones. So it's a bit of a timeline that can show a path of progress. Um, and admittedly, uh, it's a start, okay? It's not a perfect product. 
Um, this is the first one we're putting out, but what we're trying to do is to convey the various activities that are going on currently, and then the things that are yet to come. And then as time goes on, we like to kind of keep this as scrolling, okay? So some of the things that are, as they're completed, they'll fall off and the new things will appear. That's our concept, because we would like to really try to convey to you the activities that are going on and what's coming next in kind of a timeline fashion. Is there a so, that will be easily accessible? We'll continue to post it on our on our website. Yeah. Aaron, could you so, give that website? There's been a lot of references to their please. website. Some people may not know what that is, so could you give that? Do you have the actual URL? I, I don't have it. Um, if you Google EPA Region 7 Westlake Landfill, it comes up. Quick. Yeah. I don't have the URL memorized. But like I said, this is a starting point, and if you all have some feedback. I would love to talk with some of you. Come on. I know you can't read it from where you are. Um, maybe after the meeting, if you want to come up and take a closer look, um, and I, I'd love to chat with you about it if you have ideas about how we can better display that. Thanks, Mary. Yes, ma'am. satisfactory answer. Um, but that's what we've been all waiting to hear, I think. But, but thank you for asking it again because it is very important. Yes, do you? I, I would just say that uh, MDNR does 24-7 air sampling, and that's reviewed by the State Health Department, who are here tonight, and they post it on the web uh, at least twice a week. I'm not sure who's putting out the odor alert. That's not the, that would be the it's too hard. I, I, isn't it, isn't it um, actually instigated by Republic, the, the odor alert? Don't they call one? And then well, DNR gets the the Republic has to report it to DNR. Uh, sorry. Um, Ed, could you repeat that, please? Uh, Republic reports odor alerts to DNR, and then DNR sends out their emails. And so they have to self-report for an odor alert to start. Thank you. Um, and next question, Jerry, I believe you were next up. Well, I'm going to come back to that number three. Uh, again, when you described your EPA's decision making process, I, I don't know, maybe I've never worked for the government. It's a wonder you get anything done. I would, I would hope that when you have your construction manager, when you actually do this trench, is a core officer somebody that doesn't have to go around and try to get a consensus from everybody, somebody that consults with his, his subordinates and then makes a decision and moves forward. This project needs to be fast-tracked. That can be done. That's very common in construction. You get guys that take down overpasses. They start Friday night. They're done by Sunday afternoon. Okay, not to say that this project would go that fast, but it needs to be fast-tracked. It needs to be efficiently done. We can't go around asking for consensus and people writing reports and all this other kind of stuff. I would hope that when you actually do the construction, I'd like to really see how that's going to unfold. And I would hope again that it's a core officer that has the ultimate authority to do that because I don't believe the EPA is really up to that kind of stuff. If this is the way you make decisions, that's not going to work. Thank you. I liked your analogy to the, uh, the highway guys that to take a bridge out in, in, a, in a weekend to avoid disturbing traffic. But I'll bet you uh, any amount of money that they planned a long time before they did that work. And that's the phase that we're in right now. When we get to the actual construction, we will have Corps of Engineers people helping us in the field doing the construction oversight because they have the expertise on construction projects. They're going to have the power to act appropriately and quickly as the work's being done. We'll already have the decisions made on if this happens, then we do that. There'll be the eyes on the project that says, okay, this has happened. You know, let's dig out this contingency plan, which we've got ready to roll, and use it. Hi, uh, Debbie Desser. 
when they start doing the preliminary platform work and they're going to clear the vegetation, they say it's going to be piled on a clear area on the on the Westlake area, I believe. You, are you referring to the, the preliminary yeah. construction? Correct. <laughs> preliminary construction work. And when they do that, are they going to test the vegetation, make sure it's not radioactive due to the, the absorption level? And how are you going to store it? Are you going to cover it? And Because that mesh fence line is not going to block everything. And there's workers along that, that road. Are they going to be told to wear face masks? Or, I think you know. this, is a, this is a draft that the DPO is currently reviewing. I think yeah. you guys haven't come to any conclusions on it yet, have you? Yes, they have on vegetation. Well, well, keep in mind that what we have as a document now is a work plan that describes the process for them writing the actual plan that we're going to need to answer those questions that you have. So the work plan that's out there on the web page now does not answer those questions. It's describing the framework where the PRPs will propose and then we will review and hopefully approve at some point the plans to do just that, to safely store this material that they have to disturb to make sure that it stays put and it doesn't expose the workers nearby. Um, we're not to that point yet, but the work plan will be generated and it will address those issues. Thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to the whole BMAC sampling thing. Um, EPA was kind enough to invite us out on, on that Monday when they started to talk with the technicians. And Denise, you mentioned that a sodium iodide detector. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Ben, but the technician was very specific that that was the same thing that was used on the boat. The, the, the machine that was used to do the survey, I noticed this because too. The machine that was doing, used to do the survey at BMAC by EPA is using the same survey device as the community groups. It was a sodium iodide crystal. So it's just as accurate. While you're, there was a good deal of, of time spent saying that, that was an inaccurate machine for doing sampling out there, and it's the same machine in effect. That, no, no, I didn't say it was inaccurate. I said the limitation in the report didn't talk about calibration. You did though. You said you said that that is not the appropriate way to measure gamma on a land survey. And then the, to piggyback off of that, I noticed that in Cove Park, which is in fluorescent, which I have a problem anyway, fluorescent's the best. But you only it didn't state that you guys took soil samples for background. It said that you used the, the same the, you used the buggy for background. Well, I was not um, hang on just a second. Did everyone hear Don's two-part question? That's really important okay. because you guys are getting your soil samples, which is fantastic, by the way. I was very happy to see that. And Ben's correct. They are taking samples from the same location. We were very coordinated on that, and that was fantastic. However, without getting soil samples from Cove Park and Blanchette, from those different actual soil samples, when you get your soil samples back, how will you know? Because I have a document here that FUSREV uses from 1979, and um, it talks about throughout the state of Missouri, specific for radium-226 and stuff, what the background is and how they tested for it. It's already an established background. Uh, I have not read this report, and let, let me, uh, can, can I just jump in here sure. quick? Um, what, it, what has been submitted here is there's a document from 1976. How many pages is this? Uh, it's 124. 124, which I, I have not had time to read yet. Um, it is what FUSRAP uses to establish background level in the state of Missouri. And apparently those background levels are one point... For radium-226. For radium-226. One point three picocuries per gram. This was developed when they knew North County was a mess. They went all throughout the state of Missouri to get these samples because right. they had to get so, their background. Add question to make this simple for everybody in the audience. Um, the, the EPA wishes to establish a background radiation for Westlake Landfill and for BMAC so that the, the tests that come back, we can tell how elevated these levels are against uh, background. Um, there is apparently a, a document that, that is well established for FUSRAP Army Corps of Engineers um, to use as background level in the state of Missouri. And the question would be, 
are we going to use these levels, or why are we coming up with new levels, I suppose? Right. Is that correct? Like, yeah, I mean, I understand that you guys are establishing background, which, again, I think that's fantastic. You know, we already have levels here, and if they're not good levels, then obviously it's good to find that out, even though who's right to suppose these things come from. But, um, you know, the way that, they're, that you're going about finding background, when we, when we were out there at the park, you know, I, I can tell you, we, we both had a problem with the fact that they were using fluorescent. Because that is, uh, even though Coke Park is out of the 10-year floodplain, there are other parks that have been tested up there that are out of the 10-year floodplain that are coming back higher, according to tests that the DNR has done. So it's kind of an issue. Uh, thank you. And does everyone understand that question? And does anyone want to respond to that question? I was not intimately involved in planning and preparing and executing that sampling event. Um, I think this is one that we're going to have to add to Ben's list here. And when that data becomes available and we package it to share it with you folks, we will try to add an explanation that addresses your question, Don. Um, because it is a good question and I just don't know the answer to it at this point. Don, I'll follow up with you. Um, Dan, you had said that the vegetation clearing stuff had not been finalized yet on the newsletter that was sent out yesterday, the May 28 newsletter, it said that the responsible parties will be using the same vegetation removal approved in the gamma cone penetration test uh, vegetation removal. So. Did the core, all this is going to go through the core though, right? That, that pre-construction work plan is going to go through the core. So was the EPA out of line in saying that, that the, or has the core approved the, the GCPT vegetation removal? Or was the EPA premature in saying that that's exactly what's going to happen? Or has, does the core need to actually review the vegetation removal plan? And the reason that this is a concern of ours is one, the bioaccumulation bio issue that I think was sidestepped when Debbie was talking, but also the fact that EPA is finding previously unidentified areas of radioactive material at the landfill. Uh, and, and it has not done anything but overland gamma testing uh, and the, the airplane flyover for, for areas outside of OU1. So there's legitimate concern, I think, about possible, and you're using, it talks about using a, a brush hog and a grater to move this stuff. So uh, the gamma tests are only, you know, penetrating a uh, foot deep. I'm not sure how far they're going, but I think that's a legitimate concern. And can you speak to that? So, so could you boil the question down? Boil the question down, yeah. The, uh, the boil down question is, uh, is the core going to actually look over the vegetation removal plan a part, as a part of this draft uh, before the EPA signs off on the same GCPT vegetation removal that was already done? And the reason that we're concerned about that is the, the GCPT plan was posted, you know, one week and work started the next week. That didn't really allow a lot of time for public comment, if memory serves me correct. Okay, you covered a lot of ground there, and I'll, I'll try to address those bits in, in some kind of logical fashion here. Um, as far as what the, the Westlake Weekly update said, I don't remember exactly what it said, but no vegetation clearing uh, methodology has yet been approved for use during the isolation barrier construction. Uh, now, I've looked through that isolation barrier work plan as it stands, and I know that the PRPs are proposing to use the same methodology that was right. used during the GCPT work. That has not been formally approved yet. Um, in fact, we haven't even yet gotten the draft comments from the Corps of Engineers on the document in general, and uh, if they saw fit, they would comment on that particular aspect of it. Um, you might want to check the newsletter, then. <laughs> I, I can address that. <laughs> I just checked it. Okay, so I'll, so I'll read what it says. Um, it says, the process for clearing vegetation will follow the previously approved process used. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, what that probably should have said is the proposed process. Okay, mm. so, so yeah. It, it's it made a it sound fine. 
<laughs> it's a draft. It's a draft work plan, and the board will be reviewing. Thanks. Yep. Did you want to comment to to the course role in this? Yes. Um, in any place in the work plan, if they are referencing the use of another plan, we will look at that and provide okay. comments. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey Burton, again. Um, just as a, a follow-up to John's question, I guess, for Ben and Dan, uh, when looking at the definition bank background, uh, could you also clearly respond back to what is considered background uh, in terms of the rim and the limitation of where the rim is and where the trench will be allowed to be built? I know there was a lot of discussion in previous documents, but I'm not sure what the current status is. What, so in effect, what defines rent when it comes to building the, uh, the church? And did everyone hear that question? <laughs> okay. Okay, again, I'm not an expert on radiation safety or planning these sorts of field investigations, but I do know enough to say that uh, defining background is a, a difficult and statistically based process, and it's not the same process for every site. Um, so whatever background numbers the, uh, the rapid assessment tool determined from its surveys of the, the background location parks, the names that allude to me right now, um, those will not necessarily be representative of the background at Westlake. Um, second part of your question about what defines RIM for the purposes of the work at Westlake Landfill itself. That question we delved into and answered back in the Supplemental Feasibility Study in 2011, uh, where we defined uh, a so-called complete RAD removal, where we were evaluating the excavation remedies in the Supplemental Feasibility Study. We had to determine how, you know, what was the concentration that we had to dig down to and excavate to get that complete RAD removal. And for the purposes of that Supplemental Feasibility Study and excavating evaluating that excavation remedy, uh, the number for radium was five picocuries per gram plus the local background rate at Westlake, which we already have some background samples for and, and might collect additional ones as part of the remedial design. Uh, for thorium, it was also five picocuries plus the local background. And for uranium, it was 50 picocuries per gram plus the local background. What's local background? Uh, that's explained, and I don't remember the numbers right off the top of my head, but that's discussed and explained in the Supplemental Feasibility Study. It's in there. There's, it's only 1,300 pages, though. <laughs> well, it, it references background, but it never it says, says, it never says figures. Take a look at the Supplemental Feasibility Study. Okay. Yeah, but it doesn't have the numbers. Yeah, it's in there. 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 Yeah, in the SFS report. Should I just keep letting you talk there on the audio? Okay, go ahead. No, I, when, when, when background, whatever that number is, was established, was it established on site at Westlake? And there's no off site referencing? You know, that's what doesn't seem right, right to us. That's establishing a background level of contamination at a contaminated site just seems silly. And it would be one thing if it were where you said it was, but now that we know it's showing up in all these other places, you just, you just don't know. I mean... You did independent off-site the, the question is values for BMAC. Where were the there? samples taken to establish background during the, the remedial plan for Westlake? Um, and were those within the boundaries, or were they without the boundaries? Where, where did that number come from? I wish my memory were good enough to have that right off the top of my head. I do not know right off the top of my head. I believe it's referenced in either the work plan or the report for the supplemental feasibility study, where that background study came from. It probably came from the remedial investigation for OU1 back in the day, but I'm not sure of that. And again, as Denise is pointing out to me, I don't remember exactly where those locations for those samples are, but it would be likely that they would have been off-site. I just don't know off the top of my head. Thank you. Yes? Jonathan Baruch, 
with the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services about this, and he stated to me that urban areas that contain granite buildings increase gamma radiation. However, those emitters that cannot be inhaled or ingested. So again, my question is, can we receive a background level that would be comparable to a non-atomic city? And did everyone hear that question? Um, the, the question was, um, can we receive a background level that would be comparable to a non-atomic city? An atomic city referencing a city that's, that's grown rapidly increases the, the background radiation in the area. Um, so if you took a sample here, it would be elevated to start with. Um, and so we want to... Which one? Which one's going to be elevated? Uh, that's, that question has a lot of different variables wrapped into it because uh, sometimes backgrounds change over time, and they are certainly variable based on not just building construction, but the local types of rock. Um, really, a study like that, you know, from what Dawn was telling me earlier about the Foods Wrap document from 79, that's sort of a, a sampling program across the state's already been done by other agencies. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that those numbers from 79, did you say, Dawn? The 1979 study that you referenced? Right, and you know, it's, it's 30 years later, and you know, more buildings have been built, dirt's been moved around. Maybe those numbers, if they were to go and sample there again today, would be exactly the same. Uh, but the kind of study you're talking about has already been done. It sounds like now how usable those numbers are in making the kind of comparison that you want to make, I'm just not sure. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Yeah. Well, two parts of that question, two answers, two parts of the answer there. Um, as far as granite buildings uh, emitting gammas, you're, you're correct that gammas cannot be ingested or inhaled, but that's not the only way that radiation can affect the body. Um, you know, gammas can just penetrate you directly because they're rays. Background study in, inclusive of soil samples usually, um, or does it just take a gamma reading? It could be done any number of different ways. It would have to be specifically designed to answer certain questions in a certain site for certain exposure pathways. So there isn't one just you know garden variety background number that can answer the kind of questions that you're asking for. It would have to be a very specifically constructed study, and even if we did that, I'm not sure what we would gain from it here at Westlake because what really matters for the community members here is what the exposures from background sources are here. I mean, I'm sure you can find cities anywhere in Missouri that would be a slightly higher background depending on how you calculated it and places that would be slightly lower background. That doesn't change what's going on here. That, that's granted. I, I actually want to make a comment on that. Um, if you speak to Foos Rapid Handling Remediation throughout the rest of North County, um, North County is a pretty polluted area in terms of radionuclides. Um, our background is elevated, but it's not elevated naturally. It's, it's not like we were sitting on a mountaintop naked and top of the sun every day, you know. The, the truth is that we have things brought to our soil, brought into our streets, brought sometimes into the, the concrete, making the basements of the homes that they are hot, that, that were mined out of the deep ground in, in actually Brazil, brought here for refinement, and left to rot. And, and it's in our environment, it's not naturally there. And that, that's why DOE and Fuserap are cleaning up the rest of North County, and ultimately I think why everybody in this room is wondering why Westlake has sat there for 40 years without it being cleaned up. Because it's, it's ultimately the same stuff. So, so I, I get the debate about background, and what we want to look at is, is a safe background that's comparable to an area that hasn't been affected by Malacroft. That, that, that's really what we're going after. And I, and I know that the test can be complicated to establish this 
This obviously is a complicated test. No, Donald's first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you got if EPA used a control site, actually two of them for BMAC, why not use a control site for Westlake instead of establishing background at the site of the contamination? As Denise pointed out, the samples that were taken around Westlake were probably not on site as I earlier stated, but as I also earlier stated, I don't remember exactly how they were done Ed. So if you want to go dig that up and, and uh, look at how it was done and then let me know what we did wrong because I know you'll find something, um, go right ahead. All right, I'll get my interns on it. Uh, well, you know what, Ed, please um, submit that question yeah. for the next public meeting to um, basically we'll, we'll submit it and let you respond to it. Um, Don? Uh, Donna took oh. excellent notes here, but um, earlier back to the whole Coke Park thing, it says NACL simulator cannot detect less than 100 KEV. That's what you said that she wrote down. It can't detect, accurately detect it. That was what you said. Yet that's the same simulator that's on the stroller that you're pushing. And we double checked that with the, with the technicians. We actually laughed about it. I mean, and I know Ben's going to get back about it, but guys. You know, I know. I was along with Don for this, and we actually got to talk to technicians that are doing the analysis at BMAC. So we, we did talk about the machinery. That's why it struck me when, when the machine was described here that it was similar to yours. Um, you had a question? Well, just to follow up on what all this is, Ben has a nice list. <laughs> so yes, he always does. He works very hard for us. That the discussion of background levels, even if they are to be used differently in different places, it would seem to me that there needs to be an addendum that states all of that. And if, you know, there's one 1979 one, and then there's reasons for on-site and off-site and granite issues and all kinds of things, it does seem like that needs to be a big, long footnote. And then reference which one is being used. Just like you inflation adjust numbers. If you have to adjust background levels, you need to know from one report to another which one you're looking at and where it came from and why it's been used. So can we put that on Ben's list? <laughs> I mean, obviously, for scientific reports, it's an absolute necessity. And your name you have is reference levels clearly stated in reference. Would you agree? No, I think that's been done. It's just that I don't have it encyclopedically committed to my memory. It's, in the, it's probably in the remedial investigation report, and it sounds like Ed will uh, detail an intern to track that down. Well, it sounds like it's not been done across between reports. Well, that, as I said earlier, that may not be a valid comparison because of the different objectives of the studies, the different materials that are being sampled, the different instruments that are used to sample them, and the different objectives. So a background in one place is not necessarily going to equal or even be you know, comparable to a background in another place. But is the background have its own footnote clearly stated about what it is working on and why it's being used? I'm sure that we will have an explanation in each report that uses a background, for instance, the, the BMAC report that we'll have, that will talk about what we did, why we did it, yeah. okay. and what the number was. And real quick, can you tell us why background is important? Background is important because uh, you know your body does not care whether a contaminant gets into you from a background source or from a contaminated site. Um, if you are naturally or you know, living in a place that is either naturally or artificially has more of a certain contaminant, I mean, urban areas tend to have a little more air contaminants from the various industries, from automobiles than you would find out in a farm field in you know, central Missouri or something like that, away from urban areas. Um, it's important to know and understand the sources of these contaminants so that we know which, where the problem is and how to fix it. For instance, you know, if, if Westlake you know, had never happened, there would still be background levels of radiation in St. Louis. They would be coming from other naturally occurring sites or other industries or other sources within the city. Uh, we need to know what contribution to what we're seeing in all of our samples comes from those other sources so that we know how to set the cleanup levels 
for Westlake or for any contaminated site where we're taking a background. Thank you for that. Me. Um, when the soil samples come back on BMAC, if they're above background level, what remediation level are you going to use? Are you going to use DOEs, um, FOOS wraps, or EPAs? Because you have three different levels. I believe it's 2.5, 5.0, and 7.5. Mm -hmm. So what cleanup level are you going to go to if you find contamination? Uh, the simple answer to that is I don't think anybody has decided that yet. We do not have, uh, well, we have to wait for what the results are. If the results say that there's nothing above the local background, then we would have wasted our time if we came up with a plan and spent hundreds of hours trying to figure out what to do and didn't have to do it. Once we get those results, we'll know better what we have to do about them, and we'll start to ask ourselves those kind of questions if the data warrants it. Yes, sir.
Um, yes, sir. My name is Joe Lumetta. Uh, just going back to the background, when you were explaining some of the importance of it, I think it's a little more factor. Uh, I'm not sure the figures you used, but you said the background plus 0 0.5, 0 0.500, whatever, different things that show here's elevation. Well, unfortunately, if we have a reading here that exceeds the bounds of a, of a, a health issue, then if the background is found to be within the parameters of the bus percentages you're referring to, then we don't have a problem. You're referring to regulation, which defines safe levels as multiples of background Right, there was a series of, uh, of values that were given that said background plus 0.5 picocuries per gram or something of this nature. Well, if the, uh, let's just say for the sake of numbers, let's say the problem is at five, then the background only, uh, there's only a, a 0.3 difference between the actual reading and the background reading. There's only, there's not, that, there's not a five reading, there's only a three difference. But the actual reading is 12. So what I'm trying to say here is that the value of the background determines whether we have a problem or not. Correct. So it's very important where the value, where it is determined at. That is correct. Uh, at least at this site, the concentrations of the radionuclides in the room are orders of magnitude higher than the local background. So we don't have that problem that you, you're uh, speculating about there where we can't tell the difference between a variation in true background and what the contaminant is. That's, that's not the case here. The concentrations of the radionuclides in the room are, uh, in some cases, thousands of picocuries per gram for some of the samples. So that's very distinguishable from background. Now, as we get to the edge of you know, the area that has the rim in it, of course, the concentrations go down, and there might be uh, that sort of issue that you're talking about at the edges where we're trying to decide exactly where the rim, the rim stops. And, you know, in that case, in the future for the sampling for, you know, figuring where this isolation barrier goes and any other remedies, we would certainly err on the side of caution in, in making that determination. Um, and we are getting towards the end of the evening. I've gone an extra half an hour tonight just to get some more questions in. Before we close down, do we have any additional questions here? Go ahead. Are you going to do other off-site testing around the landfill? And the reason is, you started with Lady she has lost all of her, her car and her, in her home. Please keep in mind that the Ford property did have the and the that's on the other landfill. The soil samples from that, what was moved around, what was graded, not once, but twice, with dust going everywhere. You know, the location of this landfill being up high, that stuff blows, and it blows far. FEMA at this point, 08 miles to the north, you have the mobile home park there, you have canals right there that have only had surface samples taken in the water, nothing from the sediment below. Is there any, is there going to be any other off-site testing because it is possible. It's happened before in North County where dust contamination has spread off site and then it's gotten in the ditches and stuff. I mean, this site doesn't behave different physically. Right now it's covered with vegetation, but there was a time when it wasn't. Pretty there was a time recently. when that dust did fly everywhere where it was moved around it before EPA had it. As far as the sampling that EPA is planning to do, obviously, as I said, we're going to have those five off-site air monitors that will be running 24-7 um, you know, once they get started up before the construction goes on and then throughout the construction of this barrier. Um, we also have, from other agencies, including MDNR, a significant body of much more recent off-site soil sampling data. Yes, we do. That was not soil samples. That was dust, and it was an up and down. DNR doesn't like it when you guys say that, guys, because that was not a soil sample. The DNR is going on record. So, sorry, can I be recognized? Yes, you may. The may. DNR is going on record saying that was not a test of VMAG. That was simply a swipe that they did on top of a rock. And they did uh, maybe on a bench and on they the, did on, the on yeah. some grass. But that was not intended to uh, test VMAG. It was intended to 
see if the air that smelled bad was also carrying contaminants on that day. Mm -hmm. that That's not the data I'm referring to, Harvey. Okay. <laughs> uh, MDNR did a number of MDNR did a number of soil samples along Bunker Road and Towsing Road in 2005 or something like that, um, and they did not find anything in those samples. Anything above background is the best of my knowledge, and we can get you the reference for that report if you would like. Would you mind? Would you do that? Yeah, we can certainly provide you with that, no problem. That would be good news. Anyone else? Just may have a motion to close. And we have a motion to close and second. Any objections? Everyone have a good night. Thank you for attending. I hope you benefited from some information here.